Welcome to Discovering Orthodox Christianity. I'm Stacy Spanos, your host for this series of programs designed to explain the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. We're honored to be filming at the Holy Cross Chapel on the campus of Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in the beautiful city of Boston. In today's program, we'll discuss the Orthodox stance on moral and social issues. Our guests today are His Eminence, Metropolitan Nicholas of Detroit. Thank you for being here. And also Father Nathaniel Simeonidis, pastor of Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church in New York City. And he is also the director of the Archdiocesan Advisory Committee on Science and Technology. It's a pleasure to have you both here today. You. Your Eminence, let me begin with you. When we talk about moral and social issues that face Orthodox Christians, what are we talking about? Uh, I think in the United States today, we're really dealing with what we consider to be modern concerns, issues of sex and sexuality, issues of lifestyle, um, issues of medication, of treatment, of non-treatment. Uh, and we think uh, many times that these are the first times the church has looked at this. But in reality, some of these issues, especially issues dealing uh, basic social issues of, of sex and family have been issues the church has struggled with for many centuries and dealt with from the beginning of time. But certainly, the, Your Eminence, they've gotten more complex through the years. Our age is a different age, and uh, the differences in community and in society are, uh, seem to request a different answer from us at times. And sometimes um, they are issues that we have not yet explored. We didn't have uh, some of the issues based on the modern technology that uh, Father Nathan is familiar with. We didn't have uh, those kinds of concerns or questions 2,000 years ago. They're showing today. Uh, Father Nathaniel, you are the director of the Committee on Science and Technology for the Archdiocese, and this is a committee that didn't exist, what, before 15 years. Correct. Who decided that it was time that the church look into these issues? Um, well, His Eminence Archbishop Demetrius, one of the first things he did as the Archbishop of America was to establish this advisory committee because he felt the need for the church to really start discussing some of these social and moral issues, some of the uh, more ancient issues, some of the things that perhaps we, the church looked at in the past, but more uh, importantly, some of the, the newer issues uh, related to technology and uh, how they affect our lives uh, today. So His Eminence Archbishop Demetrius was the one who um, helped establish that. And give us an example of some of the things you discuss. Who is in this council? Who presents before the council? So the council is made up of, at the moment, of over 50 participants, uh, advisors. Um, and we call on all advisors uh, from around the United States to present papers to um, speak at parishes about uh, their own areas of specialty. Um, they uh, also come together at the clergy lady meetings twice, a, uh, once every two years. And we discuss issues um, such as uh, abortion. Um, we have looked at issues related to the environment, how to be better stewards of the environment, um, energy conservation, uh, we've looked at issues uh, around human cloning and the stem cell research. Um, and the hope is for this uh, committee to start issuing parish resources uh, through the uh, participation and cooperation with the Holy Synod to be able to inform the Synod of uh, the different issues of our times, to um, pretty much get the commission from the Senate to be able to go and, and offer some of the materials to our parishioners. Your Eminence, in speaking to Father Nathaniel, he informed me that they don't necessarily issue guidelines in that committee, yet on some very important social issues, the church does have stances. Give us an example of some of the stances the church has taken on certain societal issues that we're facing. Well, we have a, a, a basic concern that people have today and have had from the beginning of the history of the church are issues dealing with abortion. The church has a stance on abortion, and that stance is that the church is really pro-life. There is perhaps some development and some change that would come into play, because certainly in the first and second and third centuries and the fourth centuries and all the early history of the church, uh, it was not perhaps possible to distinguish between a medical abortion for the life of the mother, if that is to be considered, as opposed, as opposed to any abortion. So those issues have perhaps complicated the, the discussion more. 
but it's a very standard and a, a very basic question. Most people in the United States now have the sense that uh, life, again, is about what we want. And they have forgotten that life is God's gift to us. Having forgotten that, that's where the, the issue of abortion almost as a, in some cases, just a means of birth control comes in and creates a whole uh, uh, different realm of problems. Even the ability to uh, buy uh, medications that would terminate a pregnancy. We have, we have seen all of these issues again and that's in the social areas dealing about us and what we want. We've not understood that life starts out as the gift of God. And that creates a fundamental problem there. To delve a little deep, more deeply into the abortion issue, there are some who believe life begins at conception. There are others who don't believe that. Does the church weigh in on that? The church would be with life at conception. At conception. Yes. Father Nathaniel, let me ask you about some other issues, some hot button issues right now, same sex marriage. Has the church taken a stance on that? Well, the church's stance on marriage is clear. From the very beginning, marriage was always uh, the union between a man and a woman. The church only marries men and women. Um, and so on that front, yes, the church has a position. In terms of the modern day discussion, um, the modern day discussion is connected to a lot of different things, it, not just marriage per se, or the, the civil unions as some would like to call it. Um, it's, it's also connected to human rights and civil liberties. So the church, um, on the one hand, only recognizes marriage between, the, as a union between a man and a woman, but is also looking at the concerns that some of the people in the uh, gay community have, uh, such as the inability to have the same rights as a married couple when visiting uh, someone in the hospital. Um, so we are, the church is trying to put forward a position that's nuanced, that's informed, but also very consistent uh, with its faith tradition. Your Eminence, if I can ask you about another hot button issue, um, and especially one that was very prominent in your area up in Detroit, physician assisted suicide, of course, with Dr. Jack Kevorkian, who has since passed away. Yes. Does the church have a stance on that? Well, I, I think, uh, Stacey, we're going back to the beginning. Life is God's gift. Uh, recently, I was in a, in a store, and I knew the shopkeeper, and he was telling me, I had known that a year ago his wife had died, and I had gone in to see him, and I missed him. And he, so I went in now, and he told me, you know, God lent her to me for 35 years. And I think it was his way of acknowledging that part of, of the truth, that life is God's. Yeah. So the problem that we have for the uh, assisted suicide is the issue, first of all, who's, whose life is it? I'm living it. What is the dignity of the life? But there's something else that comes into play. Sometimes people feel a sense of hopelessness. And we have forgotten that sometimes in order to get to the end, we have to go through the struggle. So physician-assisted suicide is a means to end a life where one could still give glory to God, where one could still uh, have human connection is problematic to us. I would, however, I want, to, I want to pull in a different issue, and that is what happens at end of life. When do we stop, for example, uh, uh, promoting physical medical care for someone, and when in my, in my ministry, I have always tried to ask the family and, and, and work with this issue. Are we preserving the possibility of life or are we simply avoiding death? And I think that's the question that has to be meted out there. But the idea that someone alone uh, or in concert with a physician could determine that this life has no more possibility of being saved also removes whether it's frequent or infrequent is not the question, God's miraculous intervention. We remove it ourselves, and that becomes the problem. I would tell you that the greatest, I think, difficulty for the person in this position seeking a, a, an assisted suicide is the idea that in their minds they are, it, it's not worth, well, life is not worthwhile. Life has become meaningless. And sometimes it's because they don't recognize that God is with them. God is there. And he hears them, and he holds them, and he loves them. 
And that's the job of the pastor. That's the job of the priest. That's the job of the family community to come in and hold and love that person. Um, so I, I, I think that it starts out from the issue of not recognizing that life is God's gift to us. And I think it, it uh, gets more complicated when we determine that there is no hope. That, I think from a hospital perspective, if a father, you may agree with me or not, but I think that what we do in the hospitals when we don't give a person a sense of hope, we remove, to some degree, the ability to continue struggling. Father Nathaniel, uh, on your committee, you said one of the other things that you discuss is social media and the prominence of it. Along with 24-hour internet access comes a lot of pornography viewing. We know that. Has the church taken a stance on pornography, and if so, what? Absolutely, um, Stacey. So just to come back to the committee, the committee has three areas that it looks at. The first is the environment, the second is uh, bioethics and medical ethics, and the third is social media and information technology. So um, the church's position on pornography is very clear. It's something that shatters the image of Christ in each of us when we view, whether you're viewing it um, in a magazine or in on a television screen or now uh, on your computer or your, uh, your smartphone even, um, the church rejects that. And we, we have, uh, in conjunction with the uh, Information Technology Department, uh, have issued statements against online pornography. There are resources on our archdiocesan website. And the archdiocese is also working with the Roman Catholic archdiocese and the uh, Catholic, uh, the bi Roman Catholic bishops in America to offer families various resources to help educate families, um, to help protect children. Um, so there are now not only adults uh, watching pornography, but also because of the use of smartphones and the prevalence of social media in our lives, little kids are exposed to it more and more. Your Eminence, let me ask you about um, some of the issues that are polarizing a lot of Americans these days. Should the church say something about these issues, be more vocal about these issues, and risk alienating parishioners? Should we be worried about that? Which is specifically the moral issues? You're moral issues, yes. I think um, that we have to speak. I think the problem is that we are unclear what our people understand. Can we draw them into the process of, of making our statements understandable? Because that's part of the question. To simply get up and, and make a proclamation from the pulpit and have somebody not really get it and send them out into a world that 24-7 is dealing with the opposite impression doesn't help them. We need to be able to involve them in the conversation, make them understand what that means, for example, with, uh, even with the issue of pornography, that it again deals with the self. It is something about me. I want this for me. It doesn't deal with the dignity of the other person. It doesn't deal with the dignity of the human being. It, it deals specifically with the self. So I think we have to speak more clearly, uh, but we also have to speak um, more articulately to the people so that they have the ability to understand why this makes sense. We can't simply make a statement, pornography is wrong. Well, why? Why? Now when we explain it, when we talk about uh, the, the dignity of the human being, that the love that the husband would have for his wife, the fact that we are not created, our sexuality is not just for us. It happens to be a mechanism of salvation between husband and wife. And more than that, it is part of a community's uh, gift from God. So we're not here just for ourselves. And that's, that's part of where we have uh, perhaps not uh, adequately explained our message. Have either one of you lost parishioners because they didn't like the stance the church has taken on a particular issue? Have they said, oh, I'm not coming back here because of that? I know many, I, just as an example, I know many Catholics shy away from attending church because they don't agree with the uh, birth control policy of the church. I have not. Um, and I, I can't say that I stand at the pulpit and I you know, pontificate and, and claim to even know the position of the church or state the position of the church on all of these different matters. Um, the beauty of the Orthodox Church is that we have a personal connection with our people. When they come to us and they speak to us, that's when, as His Eminence said, we can discern what level they are, how much of our faith they understand. 
and offer them guidance um, and, and explain to them why the church believes this is wrong, why this is the, the church's position. And they, you engage in a dialogue and they more readily accept what the church believes rather than issuing a statement, a, a generic statement against uh, abortion or birth control or any of these issues that one might want to ask a, ch a priest or the church. Um, the personal connection, the, the interaction, the personal interaction is very important. And that's what I think keeps our people engaged in wanting to learn more. I, I would add, Stacy, that one of the problems is that we make statements and uh, uh, we cannot forget that in the congregation are people who have had abortions. Mm -hmm. In the congregation are people who are in same-sex relationships. That's a possibility there. And that's the problematic of simply making a, a, a kind of overt statement without understanding, without the people being able to understand why it makes sense to the church this way and why the other doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, I think, is the, is the greater key. So have we had, we've certainly, I've had people complain to me, that priest said something about abortion. Well, he's supposed to. But the point was, it wasn't in a context in which he could develop, give the information, and, and, and help the person understand if I would even call it in this manner, the logic and the wisdom of the church's stance. Mm -hmm. So can the problem. person just decide for themselves then what is right and what is wrong? I think sometimes people do. I think sometimes people who are not uh, coming to the church for worship, but it may be occasional visitors, people who have never uh, had the stole of the priest placed on them for confession, people who have never been able to open up themselves and ask, what am I doing? People who haven't heard and we've said this before, who haven't heard uh, the voice of God to Paul on the road to them, what are you doing? When a person comes into contact with God in that force, the light, their life is changed. And once our life is changed, all these things become discussable in a real way because the person is seeking to learn. Sometimes we ask questions because we want a particular answer. We don't really want the truth. We want a particular answer. Uh, what I'm getting, the sense I'm getting of Orthodox Christianity throughout these programs is one of, Orthodox Christianity is like a parent, an authoritative parent, but not an authoritarian parent, that they uh, have guidelines, but they also approach each situation differently and come from a spirit of compassion and love. That's the sense I'm getting. Am I off in thinking of it that way? I, I think, I always go back to the baptismal statement, blessed is God who desires that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Our goal is to help everybody on that journey. For some people, the same issue, what appears to be the same, might require uh, strictness. For somebody else, it might require some laxity. Mm -hmm. Because the issue is not to stop them, it's to make them stop and think, what are we doing? And then to help them move on. So there is, there are rules. But that's why the, 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 the bishops, the priests, uh, by extension, have that ability to help make the exception for the person. And Father Nathaniel, we've seen uh, other denominations that are very rigid in their rules. Absolutely no homosexuals. Uh, absolutely not this, absolutely not that. And in fact, a lot of them preach it from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. um, that is not the style of the Orthodox Church. Is that a concerted effort not to be that way? <laughs> If I may, Stacey, there are other, also other denominations that say anything goes, right? So they were, we invite everyone. Everyone's invited to the table. So uh, just come as you are. Don't worry about anything. Just come. And I would say that neither of those uh, represents what the Orthodox Church is or tries to do. And I, if I may, I think the Orthodox Church can be compared to a hospital. Um, and the pastor or the bishop is the doctor. And... Christ is the doctor. We come to the church to be healed. And every one of us has ailments. And so when we go to the doctor, when we go to the hospital, it takes that physician, it takes time for him or her to come to get to know you, to, do, to diagnose what's wrong with you, uh, to establish a, a history of uh, medical issues with your family, with you to be able to then guide you, to give you a, the proper prescription. So that is what the church is. The church is ultimately the body of Christ. And people come to be incorporated into it, not to be necessarily cut off uh, from the body of Christ. And we do that in different ways for each, peop for each person, depending on what it needs, what that person needs to be grafted onto that body. 
Stacey, I'm going to add something here sure. because what Father is saying is what we have said earlier as well. He made an important statement. Everyone is invited. He made, used, used the words, come as you are. You can come as you are, but you better leave differently. Mm -hmm. Somehow God's grace and his power and his wisdom and his strength should change us as we enter his church, as we hear his word, as we see his sacred image, as we live that life. We can come as we are but we should go as he asks us to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the unique difference in how we try to approach this. So we're not going to, he's not going to sit up and say, You're, you can't come, come, come to the table, change, change. Let's talk about some of the people that um, Americans have chosen to serve them in a political capacity. Should their religious ideals guide them in any way or do you believe it should be completely separate. Do you believe there should be separation between church and state? I'm going to start on Father's <laughs> Wing. I, I think that living in the United States, we recognize that there is a separation of church and state. That to me means that the, that the government is not going to oversee the teaching, the ministry, uh, uh, the, the, the general practice of the church. To assume, however, that a person who has a faith background, all of a sudden becomes some kind of divided personality and enters government service without the strength and character of that background is not fair either because it implies the person is, uh, you know, somehow uh, uh, not a whole personality but a split personality. So I think that we also choose uh, people. Uh, based on the courage and the commitment that they have of their convictions, convictions that are not specifically uh, uh, religious or secular, but which somehow weigh into that idea that we would call that eternal truth. And we look at that eternal truth as being godly and divine. With that being said, would you trust somebody in public office who did not have a spiritual background or a religious background? I can as long as I'm witnessing the courage of their conviction. So I have to, if I have a sense of what their conviction is, I understand the basis on which they will see things because each one of us comes with a bias. Each one of us comes with some kind of way in which we look at things. So I am, uh, I am convinced that people whose uh, uh, faith background allows them to recognize that they alone are not the only they are not the final source of life and they are not the final authority. I think that helps in weighing out and in making decisions. Yeah, what Father Nathaniel, can we have morality if we don't believe in a God? Well, I would say that faith, uh, faith in God is transformative, it's salvific, um, and therefore it affects not only who we are first and foremost, but it should affect our actions. So you can have faith in God, or say that you have faith in God, but that faith becomes an ideology, and all you have is uh, a set of tenets and, tenets and principles, and, and so your actions are, are not really guided by faith in, in God. And you, may, you can have a person that is struggling to find out who God is, um, and ultimately, like His Eminence said, knows that he or she is not the ultimate authority at the end of the day and understands that they are finite, that can make a positive difference in life. So I, I, we need faith in order for our actions to be transformative in this world. Uh, but somebody who's struggling with faith or is trying to grow in faith or trying to find faith can also make a difference, I would say. Your Eminence, how can our Orthodox faith play a role in the personal choices that we make? I think that we have to recognize that our life is here on the one hand to give glory to God and to thank Him for the gift of life, and on the other hand, to love and ennoble the people whom He likewise has made. It's interesting that in the story of creation, the only thing that God creates with his own hands is the human being. So there's a very personal sense uh, when we talk about man in the image of God, humankind in the image of God. There's a very personal relationship with God uh, and man. So I think that our uh, function on this is to 
recognize where we come from, and to do, we had in the last, last Sunday's gospel reading, Jesus unusually has this conversation with his father. He says, I did what you told me to do. I have come and I have done what you have told me to do. And I think backwards, that's what we have to say to the people. We are doing what God has called us to do. And he has called us to help, to minister, to serve. He has called us to stand for the right uh, uh, of, of uh, personhood. He has called us to protect the unborn. He has called us to do many things, to recognize the need to act properly in his name to give him glory. And if we have lost sight of our moral compass, is there a way to redemption? Can we get it back? Absolutely, there's hope for everyone. And each of us has to constantly keep refining our compass, our moral compass, um, to keep pointing north. And that's what the role of the church is, to constantly come to ask Christ for forgiveness, to repent, to tweak our understanding of our role in this world, how we can make a difference, to learn from our mistakes, not to try not to repeat our mistakes, and ultimately to sanctify our lives so that we can make a real difference in the world. Like the prodigal son. Like the prodigal son. And your eminence, I'd, I'd like to end with you. What advice or what would you say to someone right now who maybe has made a, a terrible moral decision, they feel badly about it, what would you say to them? You know, uh, terrible moral decisions are some, something like secrets. We can't really keep them. But you have to know that you can talk to someone in confidence and in trust to help sort it through. So the first thing I would say is don't sit in the corner alone. The church is waiting. The Lord's arms are open. And we're here really as his servants to welcome you home, welcome you to, back to the church so that he can put his loving embrace around you. Yes, you made a mistake. I may, a day doesn't go by that I, I couldn't have done something differently, but I'm grateful because I know that God, and I know that in my heart, in his love, receives me, forgives me, and will let me continue as I try in my feeble way to give him glory and to preach his truth. Thank you so much. Your Eminence Metropolitan Nicholas of Detroit and Father Nathaniel Simeonidis, thank you. Thank you. And I invite our guests to log on to our YouTube channel for more programs in this series. They're called Discovering Orthodox Christianity. You can find us at youtube.com slash Greek Orthodox Church. I'm Stacey Spanos. Thank you for joining us.